Andrew Gosden, a 14-year-old boy who disappeared back in 2007, withdrew £200 from his bank account, booked a one-way ticket to London, never to be seen again. So let's get into this case and you can tell me what you think at the end. Andrew Paul Gosden was born on the 10th of July 1993 to his family who all lived in Balby in the suburb of Doncaster and that's South Yorkshire so that's a part of England and in the north of England. Andrew Gosden's parents were both committed Anglian Christians but had not baptised their children as they did not want to impose their views onto them. Now, prior to his disappearance, he had not been to the church for 18 months. He had been a Cub Scout, but a few months before his disappearance, told his father that he no longer wanted to involve himself with the group. His family described him as a home bird, he often left the house and never went without saying where he was going. He was known to his family as Rue. Andrew was a gifted student. He had a 100% attendance record at the school that he attended, which was a Catholic high school for gifted children. It was called the Young, Gifted and Talented Program, which was designed to enhance the educational development of the top 5% of school pupils. He had even been expected to score straight A's in his GCSE examinations later that year. Andrew was described as a prize-winning mathematician and was destined for Cambridge. He was described as having a neutral attitude about school and was hoping that the new school term would provide a bit more of a challenge after having kind of cruised through his education that year. Andrew tended to say little about his school life to his parents when they asked him and during the 2006 summer holidays, Andrew attended a two-week residential school at Lancaster University as part of the Young, Gifted and Talented program that he was under. The summer school was for children from all over the UK, aged 11 to 16, who were in the top 5% academically. His parents were so proud of him and they recalled that when he came home from the summer school, he seemed to be enthused about what he'd been doing there. Andrew was described as being happy about life and even in his own company, he just seemed happy doing his own thing and playing on his Xbox. He wasn't a loner as such, as he had his own small group of friends that were quite like-minded as himself. However, Andrew's family say that he did not socialize with his friends outside of school. He tended to hang around with them more in school time, but when he came out of school, he just wanted to be on his own in his room, playing his games and doing his schoolwork. Andrew exhibited no signs of depression. There were no indications that he had been subjected to any bullying. Not that he told his parents exactly what was going on at school, but he never seemed fed up or like there was anything weighing him down on his mind. He never mentioned to any of his friends anything about any bullying. And so it wasn't something that his family were particularly concerned about. Andrew was said by his father to be absent-minded, not streetwise, like some children of his age, and potentially a little bit vulnerable just because he wasn't one of these children that hung around on the streets like some of them. 
He was one that would come home after school, take off his bag, maybe have something to eat, go up to his room, read, do his schoolwork and play on his games. He had a deep character who did not get worked up. He never got moody and his teachers characterised him as a shy, quiet young man with a mature nature well beyond his years. Other sources stated that although Andrew was aged 14 when he disappeared, he looked a lot younger than his age, perhaps more 12, as he was small and not as tall as some of his friends. Andrew wore strong prescription glasses, was deaf in his left ear and had a distinctive double ridge on his right ear. Andrew had light brown hair, but was planning to dye it black before he disappeared. Now, Andrew owned a couple of mobile phones between the ages of 10 and 12, but he rarely used any of them and subsequently lost them and didn't always get them replaced. It was almost like it was something that he didn't really need. He wasn't calling his friends every five minutes. He just didn't really need them. He was given a new phone for his 12th birthday, but also rarely used this and did not want to replace it when he lost it months before his disappearance. And when his parents offered to replace the lost mobile phone, he stated that he would prefer an Xbox instead. Andrew was interested in video games, metal bands, and so now you can see why he wanted to dye his hair black just before he disappeared. He wore a lot of dark clothes and he was last seen wearing the Slipknot t-shirt, black jeans, trainers, um, a watch on his left wrist and carrying a black canvas satchel with patches of rock and metal bands on it. Now during the 2007 school holidays, typically July to September here in the UK, Andrew's parents had suggested that he travel alone to London to stay with his grandparents, but he chose not to go. At the time of his disappearance, Andrew was eight days into the new school year. So after returning from the school holidays, he was just eight days in, and in the days leading up to his disappearance, Andrew twice chose to break his normal routine. His parents had reported that he told them he walked home from school rather than taking the bus. Walking the four mile, which was 6.4 kilometer route from his school to his home, which would have taken him around one hour and 20 minutes to walk rather than the short bus ride home. The evening before the day of his disappearance, was described by Andrew's father as fairly uneventful. The family ate together as usual and they all washed the dishes afterwards. Andrew spent an hour making a jigsaw with his father on the table and then watched some comedy programs on television, including Mock of the Week and The Mitchell and Web Look with his mother. So nothing too eventful apart from, you know, him kind of not getting the bus and walking home all that way, but there was nothing that really stood out to them. Now on the morning of the disappearance, Andrew had difficulty waking up and seemed particularly irritable. His mother had stated that this was fairly unusual for him as he normally woke up on time. And at 8.05, Andrew left the house and was witnessed walking across the local park, Westfield to his usual bus stop by the family friend, Alan Murray, who was sitting on a bench in the park. Instead of taking the school bus, Andrew diverted from his usual route and walked to a cash machine at a local garage where he drew out 200 pounds from his bank account, which was almost all of his money. He had like 214 pounds in the account in total but the ATM machine would only allow withdrawals of 20 increments. So he drew out the 200 pounds and he was captured on the neighbor's CCTV system returning home after he'd withdrawn that money. 
So at home, Andrew placed his uniform in the washing machine and his blazer on the back of his chair. He then changed into casual clothes consisting of a black slip knot t-shirt and black jeans and took a bag embellished with various patches of rock and metal bands. He also took his wallet, keys and a PlayStation portable console with him. No other possessions were identified as missing by the family and it was quickly established that he had not taken his passport or any other money that they could tell. Andrew's father stated that his son did not appear to have taken a sweatshirt or a coat or anything to keep him warm and had also not taken the charger for his PSP. Andrew also left around 100 pounds in cash that he had saved up from birthdays in the house. Now at 8.30am Andrew departed from the house. He was last seen heading down Littlemore Lane towards Westfield Park on a neighbour's CCTV. He then walked to Doncaster Railway Station and purchased a one-way ticket to London which cost £31.40. Now the ticket seller later recalled that she had told him that if he got the return ticket it would have only cost him 50 pence more but for some reason he insisted on purchasing the single ticket which would make you think that he had no intention of returning now at 9 35 a.m andrew was seen boarding the train to king's cross station alone a woman reported sitting next to him and she described him as being quite engrossed in playing with this video game console that he'd taken with him. When Andrew failed to attend morning lessons at his school, his teachers tried to contact his parents. The school believed that maybe he was sick and they left a message with the parents when they were unable to get hold of them. They informed them that he had not attended the school that day. However, the school dialed the number of the parents either above or below Andrew in the register and not actually Andrew's parents. It was the wrong number. Andrew arrived at King's Cross Station at 11.20am. He was captured on CCTV, leaving the main entrance of the station at 11.25 a.m., which was the last confirmed sighting of him. The midday temperature in London on that day was 19 degrees C, peaking at 21 degrees C at 4 p.m., which is considered to be warm in England. That evening, his parents arrived home sat down for dinner thinking that Andrew was either in the converted cellar playing video games or in his room doing his homework. And when the family discovered that he was not in the house, they initially thought that he maybe was with a friend or a neighbour, although, you know, that was not really what he would do typically. And they just thought maybe he'd lost track of time. Andrew's parents telephoned his friends who informed them that Andrew was not there and had not been at school that day either. At around 7pm, the police were called and Andrew's sister, Charlotte, stated that it was a complete panic. We initially thought something must have happened on the way to school when we found out that he hadn't even been there that day or arrived. Charlotte, his sister and the father, Kevin, scouted Andrew's route to school and areas nearby but found nothing. Within three hours of discovering Andrew's disappearance, a missing person's leaflet was produced for circulation. Andrew's family and friends searched the area until nightfall. That weekend, the police searched the bushes near their home in Doncaster but found nothing. Three days later, after speaking to the woman who had sold Andrew his ticket, police confirmed that he had travelled to London and the ticket seller at Doncaster Station remembered Andrew because he had refused this return ticket despite it only costing like a small amount to come back. Andrew's father later stated that the purchase of the single ticket rather than the return did not seem strange to him as Andrew 
knew numerous people in London with whom he could have stayed with. Initial searches in London focused on the Chislehurst and Sidcup areas where the Gosden family had relatives. And days after the disappearance, the family travelled to London themselves and handed out flyers and posters in the vicinity of anywhere they felt that Andrew may have been or may have been visiting, especially museums and exhibitions. The South Yorkshire Police, SYP, said that it had asked British Transport Police to search the CCTV footage within two days of Andrew going missing, but, but could not pick him from out of the crowds. Three weeks later, CCTV footage at King's Cross Station, again reviewed by the police, did identify Andrew. And the CCTV image of Andrew leaving the main concourse of King's Cross was circulated in the media, accompanied by a close-up of his right ear and the distinctive double ridge. The family and the police investigated the possibility that Andrew had gone to London to meet someone to whom he had met over the internet. However, there was no evidence of this. Andrew did not use a computer at home. His father stated that Andrew did not have an email address and had not set up an online account on his Xbox or PSP. The police took the computers from Andrew's school and Doncaster Library for their digital forensic investigations, but found no trace of any activity by Andrew. An investigators sent the unique serial number of Andrew's PSP to Sony HQ, who checked and found that there was no record of an account being set up or communication established on the device. The Sony PSP 1000 had a dim, allowing Sony to see when a PSP had connected to the internet. The only PC in the house was his sister's laptop, which had only been in her possession for eight weeks. Andrew's sister had stated that he did not seem interested in social media or connecting with other people through the internet as he just didn't seem social. A year after Andrew's disappearance, the head teacher at the Catholic high school where he attended travelled to London with staff and pupils and distributed 15,000 leaflets. I just think that's amazing and such a good thing to do because Doncaster is nowhere near London, guys. It's quite a travel. After the initial CCTV trail went cold, the investigation moved to trying to establish why Andrew may have decided to even travel to London in the first place. I mean, initially the family had thought that it was to visit family or to visit maybe some friends, but... When they rang the family and friends, there was no one that had seen him. And then when they had maybe considered the option that he'd met somebody on the internet, that was also quickly ruled out because they said he just wasn't social. An early theory was put forward by the family was that he decided to take in some sites, maybe like museums, as the family was known to have enjoyed London and they visited the capital with family to see his grandparents, aunts, uncles and family friends who all lived there. He was enjoying visiting the museums and exhibitions down there and according to his father, he'd also had good knowledge of how public transport worked down there, the layout, the tube and he was confident in navigating his way around the city and it's a big city. And travel on the buses was free for children at the times of his disappearance. One event that was noted by his father as a possible reason for his son to maybe have travelled to London in 2007 was the, 2000, was the 2007 YouTube gathering. However, there's no evidence that Andrew attended this event or even had any interest in YouTube. It was just something that was going on around about the time that he disappeared. The family also looked into music concerts that were maybe happening around that time that Andrew had, might have gone to London to attend. The night of the disappearance, 30 Seconds to Mars was playing in Brixton and 
Another band that he liked played at a scheduled farewell show at the Carling Academy. The venue was in walking distance from King's Cross and was originally scheduled for 4pm on that day, the 7th of July, and was to be the last show with the original vocalist, but he didn't get a return ticket. Mick Neville, retired head of the Metropolitan Police's Central Images Unit, believed the theory that he might have gone to this concert because he would have arrived there around about the time that this was kind of starting and he appealed for anybody with photos or videos taken at the gig to come forward in case he had snapped a shot of Andrew. Neville went on to state that there is a canal nearby which was called Regent's Canal and it's unclear whether this was ever dredged or checked Although Andrew was a fan of similar metal bands, there's no evidence that he attended these shows or even really liked them. The Gosden family hypothesised that maybe Andrew had gone to London to attend a show by a band that he was known to be a fan of. Finnish band, HMI, did a promotional sign-in at the HMV store on Oxford Street on the 17th of September in 2007 and performed an invitation only show the same evening at the borderline venue in Soho. But the only way to get into this show was by competing various contests and giveaways. The lead was investigated by the family with help from HIM, but it did not produce any meaningful leads. Andrew's father, also stated that he'd suspected that Andrew might have gone to London to do something which he felt it was easier to seek forgiveness for rather than permission. Speaking in 2009, two years later, Kevin Gosden speculated on the reason for Andrew's disappearance. Did he decide to go to the Reginald Perrin thing and reinvent himself or was there something troubling him? Was he feeling some kind of way and just didn't express that to his family? Something maybe that he just couldn't tell them? His father said, In my heart, I still think the disappearance was a spur of the moment thing rather than a planned thing. Because if you think about it, guys, he actually set off to school with his school uniform on kind of got as far as the bus stop because he'd been seen and then turned around and went home. I mean, that could have been in case his family saw him in the morning with his uniform on, I guess, but why walk as far as the bus stop? I don't know. But he went home, took the uniform off, got changed and then headed to London. Well, it's obviously a very frustrating time when a child disappears and the family were very critical of the police's decision to concentrate on investigating the family rather than requesting CCTV footage beyond King's Cross during the initial stages of the investigation. But I guess it's typical as it's a normal thing when somebody goes missing, their family members are usually the ones that are looked at first. But I can see how this is very frustrating for the family themselves because when you know you're innocent and you're just thinking, why are they just not doing this? Or why are they not looking past me? But they have to do that and they have to do their job the way that they're trained to do it, I guess. I mean, the father claimed that the police viewed him as a suspect during the initial stages and they carried out unlawfully recorded interviews aimed at pursuing him into revealing the reason of his son's disappearance, according to the father. Now, the father and the wider family were cleared of any involvement after this, but obviously for the family, it was quite frustrating. Now, the police asked the BTP to search the available CCTV footage within two days of Andrew being reported missing. However, the police could not locate Andrew in the crowds, so it was sent to an officer in London to assist with the search. And after this, Andrew was spotted, like we said earlier. However, 
The CCTV footage from buses and the adjacent tube station was not requested by the authorities. And furthermore, the father claimed that the reported sightings of Andrew at a pizza hut and a Covent Garden were followed up and that the police did not speak to the woman who reported the Covent Garden sighting for six weeks after she reported seeing him. Now, there were 122 possible other sightings that were reported all over Britain from 45 in London and 11 from Brighton. I mean, as we know, guys, when it's been reported that somebody's missing, especially if it makes it to the media, you do get a lot of people calling in and not always people that actually have seen him or see someone who maybe just looks like him. And it can be frustrating for the police because they have to look into every lead. Andrew's father said that there were two or three sightings within the first week of the disappearance that seemed credible, partly because of the way the witnesses claimed Andrew spoke to them. Andrew's family believed that the most plausible sighting to be the one which placed Andrew at the Pizza Hut or on Oxford, on Oxford Street, which was 2.6 miles or 4 kilometres when I was walk from King's Cross, and that was on the day that he went missing. And there was another additional unconfirmed sighting on Oxford Street on Monday the 17th of September. And Andrew was said to have been sleeping in a park, which seems a bit strange to me because he'd taken £200 with him. And I know London is really expensive, but I'm sure he could have found somewhere to stay, which, unless he was trying to conserve money but it certainly does not sound a very safe thing to do sleeping in a park in London and especially to say that he had a comfy bed at home and there didn't seem to be too much going on at home that would make him want to leave in the first place. He certainly had gone with enough money to get the train home too. And on the 19th of September, five days after he disappeared, he'd also been a possibly seen up Sheen Lane and along Upper Richmond Road and it was reported that he appeared to have obtained warmer clothes. A woman reported a potential sighting of him on the 17th of October, a month after he disappeared in Covent Garden and she spoke to a boy and she stated that he did look like a boy and he looked like the boy she'd seen on the TV that was missing but the boy denied that he was Andrew when she asked him. Later, another reported sighting, including a park, which is even further afield in South Wales, and then one in Plymouth, which is kind of down the bottom end, um, the south of Britain, which seems unlikely when he travelled to London, why he would then travel so far south. The other was in a pub in South End. None of these sightings could be verified. However, Andrew's father said none of the sightings were followed up by the police and the woman who reported the Covent Garden sighting was not spoken to, like we said, for six weeks after the disappearance. Now, in November 2008, so a year after he'd gone missing, a man visited Leominster Police Station in Herefordshire, West Midlands, and used the intercon system to talk to a police officer, stating that he had information about Andrew. Now, as it was the evening, the intercom system, the intercom system was in use rather than a staffed reception disc, which would be what you would get normally during the day over here in Britain. And by the time an officer arrived to take the details, the man had left. Police later appealed for that, this man to get back in touch with them and subsequently an individual claiming to be, which must have been very frustrating for the family. Subsequently, an individual claiming to be the man at the police station wrote anonymously to the BBC TV after it featured the case on the one show. He gave details of a possible sighting of Andrew in Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury in November 2008. Now, it was not confirmed that it was the same man on both occasions and if so, why did, it, why did he not wait at the police station? 
Now in 2009, two years after he'd gone missing, the family released aged progressed images of what Andrew may look like now at the age of 16. To mark the second year of his disappearance, and in November 2009, Kevin, Andrew's father, appealed to the gay community to help find his son. They tried to consider the fact that he may have possibly been struggling with his orientation and maybe it was something that he ran away from rather than so that he did not have to face his family over it. Now, Kevin, Andrew's father, said, we are pretty open-minded, our family. So we have wondered maybe if he was gay and was struggling with his identity and found it too awkward to raise. If he was gay, we do not have any issues with it at all. He is loved unconditionally. It's just so sad, guys. In May 2011, the police paid a private company to conduct a sonar search of the River Thames. And this is a big river using the same technology that is used to locate victims and objects under the sea. No trace of Andrew was found during the search, though it did find another body. In 2016, Andrew's parents appealed for information on the BBC show flagship current affairs television programme Panorama. The following year, to mark the 10th anniversary of his disappearance, the charity Missing People made Andrew the face of their Find Every Child campaign, with Andrew featured on billboards and advertisements throughout the UK. Now, on the 12th of September 2017, the police made a fresh appeal for information. This family are not giving up. They want their son home. A statement on the South Yorkshire Police Facebook page said police were investigating requests for similar optical prescriptions to Andrews requesting documents from any clients, patients that may have the same prescription as Andrew to come forward and to let them know about this. The passport office or national insurance was circulating Andrew's DNA fingerprints and dental and health records. The tone of the statement suggested that the police believed Andrew may still be alive. In June 2018, the Gosden family said that someone had reported an online conversation with a person whose username was Andy Rue, who claimed that their boyfriend had left them and they needed £200 to cover rent. When someone offered to send the money, the user claimed that he did not have a bank account as he had left home when he was 14. The link was investigated by police, but the person was never identified. And in 2018, to mark Andrew's 25th birthday, two updated age progressed photos were released by the family. It was announced that the band Muse would help publicise the campaign to find Andrew and in October 2019, another age-progressed image of Andrew was released. Andrew's family have kept his room exactly the same as he had left it. It's not been changed. The locks on the house are still the same as they knew that Andrew had taken his key when he left. Andrew's bank account has not been used since he disappeared in 2007. Now on the 11th of January 2022, South Yorkshire Police said that on the 8th of December 2021, detectives had arrested two men aged 38 and 45 on suspicion of kidnapping. The older man's arrest was also connected with possession of child PORN and both men have been released under investigation while inquiries continue. But they are believed to be the first arrests made in connection with the disappearance. The following day, it was announced that numerous devices had been seized from these two men to be forensically investigated. The police said that it could take up to six months to a year and Andrew's father thanked the public for their support and said the family did not know any more than what the police had released at that time. So Andrew is still missing after leaving his home back in 2007. 
That's a long time ago for a child taking a one-way trip to London to never be seen again. What do you think the reasons for his disappearance are?